used your creativity, your effort, your energy, your skills um, in some way. Um, and we're going to appreciate that. Um, the second thing I would say is uh, it, it may give us admissions officers a chance to reset as well, right? We, we, we always expect everyone to come in having cured a tropical disease and started an orphanage and uh, mentored, you know, uh, the, a high school student. And it's, there's always so much somebody can do. So I would say emphasize quality over quantity. Don't worry that you can't do five or six incredible, you know, things and check a lot of boxes, but think about, okay, what are the one or two things that I am able to do or that really mean the most to me and really focus on them? And then tell us, as it's not as much about what you did as what you learned about yourself and, and you know, how it's going to impact you on this journey. Right. It's extremely important to describe how each of these experiences uh, has affected you and, and what you've learned from it. Uh, you know, in the AMCAS application, there's an, uh, there's places for you to actually go over these things. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, applicants are, are sometimes asking us for potentially concrete examples of, of, of things you can do. Um, and so I think, you know, just Daryl, we, we can provide you with some of them. And, you know, uh, you have to look at some of the items that are kind of like impervious to, to COVID. So, you know, one that we've always talked about has been, um, you know, EMS. I mean, they're, they're always training EMTs. They're always going to need EMTs. So that's one potential opportunity for you. And then another is Scribe. Over the last couple of years, uh, that's become a, a very prominent listing upon um, you know people's uh, AMCAS applications. And and there's a, a lot of value to being a, a scribe uh, in a number of ways. You know, one, you know, you're at the bedside with a provider. Two, you're actually learning the uh, ins and outs. In all the details and specifics of the history and physical exam, which are going to become extremely critical to you when you uh, enter med school and, and beyond. And I guess the, the last one is you're also, you know, sometimes, you know, supported financially by doing this work as well. So uh, you, you can offset some of your, your, your costs. Uh, another thing, you know, we've talked about, you know, I guess, Daryl, you can always interrupt me at any point. But, you know, we've always talked about, you know, people, um, you know, kind of going into hospice as well. And uh, part of that is, you know, it, you're going out of your comfort zone. There's a lot of ambiguity with this because it's not like the first two we talked about. It's, it's a very different sort of you know, perspective that you're you know, approaching the, the patient um, interaction. And then, um, you know, some places still allow for in-person hospice, but I, we found that our, some of our applicants have become, become very creative in that they have done virtual hospice visits or even just phone visits. And, and so, you know, again, anytime there is a potential problem, find a way to solve that problem. You, you can either let the problem consume you or you can consume the problem. And I think what we'd like to see is like you know, how you would have, you know, gone through this and, and found a, a solution to something that didn't have a solution before. And I guess another thing we've talked about is the, the text, um, you know, hotline, you know, for, um, you know, various sort of, uh, um, you know, items. And I guess in your generation, you're always, you know, you're, you're in the, the text generation more than, you know, some of us. And so this is, again, a one-on-one -on -one clinical interaction that you're trying to so solve a, a diagnostic dilemma. So, you know, that's another thing you can be involved with as well that, you know, it reflects, you know, our, you know, patient interactions. And I don't, Daryl, you have any, did I miss anything or anything else we've talked about in the past? Or? I think that's good. VJ, did you have anything? No, I'm, I think that just um, reiterating, just doing something and getting really involved in a handful of things rather than 50 million little things and showing that you're invested in it and you're learning from it, I think has uh, seemed to help me on my interview path. I haven't been involved as much in admissions, but um, just coming across genuine in the things that you do, uh, I think would help you more than doing a lot of other things. All right, well, thank you very much for that uh, enlightenment. Um, a, a related question would be, uh, how do your schools view virtual shadowing? Is, I'll, is start. I'll, I'll start. I'll uh, start. We actually, 
don't worry about tracking shadowing. Um, I think shadowing is is more for you as an applicant to decide, is this for me? Is this, uh, can I, is, I see myself doing this. Is this a path I want to start on? Because it's you know, even just being in pre-med is it's a, it's a long it's it, it's a journey unto itself. Um, we don't look at it uh, as you know, we don't say oh, how many hours did somebody shadow because honestly almost everyone is able to shadow in some way, shape, or form, and it's it's so passive that I'm not sure I, I'm going to learn much about you if if someone who's talking about their shadowing experience often ends up talking about the doctor they shadowed. And I want to learn more about you, not the person that was your role model. So use it to help inspire you to you know, get you to learn more about yourself. But um, uh, it's not critical to us as to how much shadowing, what type of shadowing. Um, you know, Linton, I don't know what you all think. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Gerald. I mean, there's, we for us, we kind of look at it from two different perspectives. There's like an active patient interaction and a passive patient interaction. And what we would like you to have is active patient interactions because, you know, that's one on one with a person you know, versus the passive one. You're just standing off to the side. Now, granted, with the way things are now, you know, that may be the only thing you can get and, and, and we're willing to, you know, accept that as well. But, you know, you're going to have to, you know, again, describe what you learned. You know, if you're doing virtual shadowing, what did you learn from that patient interaction? Did it, you know, you know, did the physician interact, you know, correctly with the, the patient or incorrectly? You know, what value did it have to you and, and what value did that, you know, interaction have to the patient as well? And so you, you've got to be able to describe, you know, what happened in there, you know, what, you know. but yeah, in, just in terms of virtual things, you know, again, it's not the hours, it's the quality, not the, the quantity of, of the experience, but, you know, we're looking at virtual shadowing, um, in a different light than we, we had in the, in the past. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for addressing that. Um, our next question is what are some things that students can do now as uh, undergrad or post med students that out can fully when education Well, I think that the primary, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh. I, I think the, the primary thing that needs to run through your applications is that you care about people. Because I, I think that's got to be the, the first element there, because it's very difficult to teach someone to care for someone if they don't want to. And, uh, you know, we can teach you all about the nuances of, uh, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis, sepsis. You know, pulmonary mechanics, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we, we can't make you care about people. You either got to want to do it or, or not. Because that, you, if you don't like to care about people and you go through medicine, you, you're going to be miserable because you're going to have to interact with people on a, on a daily basis. So that's got to be the, the common theme that, that goes throughout your, your application. And it's like, you know, why do you like doing this? What you know? What you what have you done to support your thought process in in, in going into, into medicine? And so it's got to you know kind of you have to kind of create a, a story or a um, you know a, a, you know some sort of document that kind of supports um, why you want to do this. And you know the the clearer you can paint that sort of picture, um, you know the, the better for you. And I don't know, Daryl, you want to maybe add something on that or yeah, yeah, we're aligned and you're probably going to hear this common theme of we're not giving you as many concrete things of like, oh, if you just did A, B, and C, it's more important that, like you said, that you show us you, you care about people, that you're the type of person who gets involved. Um, that's the kind of that's the kind of clay we can work with. It's our job to teach you all the other things, but if you're if you're the type of person who's engaging and uh, connects with people and gets involved and wherever they wherever they live and wherever they work. Um, wow, that's that's the type of person. Now we can harness that and turn you into a great doctor. Um, and then I'll, I'll go along with saying, and then show us, don't tell us is kind of my my favorite saying. Is that anyone can say, I like to I like to talk to people, I like to help people, I like I did research. Well, 
if you tell me a story of just one example, one anecdote of you getting involved in your community or, or struggling, you know, interacting with a patient, now you, you've just you've just given me evidence. You don't have to convince me. I, I, I see it right there. I already believe it because you told me a story. You you relayed an experience and maybe what you learned from it. Um, so so think of it in those terms, not as much about um, checking different boxes. Right. Yeah. This isn't a checkbox. This is an investment. And so we have to see that you're not just going through the motions. And there, there has to be, you know, concrete, you know, you know, reproducible, you know, if you want to use evidence based sort of items that it has to be that way. And, uh, you know, yeah, again, the, the common theme is, has, you know, be that you care about people and, and you know, this is why you're, you're going to go ahead and do this. And, I think, you know, Gerald, we, we were on just a, a panel of handful of days ago that um, one of the panels actually suggested keeping a, a diary or log of, of your patient care experiences. And I, I think we, we thought that was a fantastic idea. So, so that way, you know, years later, you, you know, you, and you might not, you might not remember, you know, what happened there, but you can actually, you know, paint, you know, a, and, and give us a, a nice visual as to what that patient experience was and, and you know, makes your I think your essays a lot easier because you kind of have all these little details that of what you um, learned, you know, about uh, you know at that time. So, um, you know, maybe um, I guess that would be one suggestion: keep a, a log of you know things that you found valuable when you were you know working with your patients. Yeah, I love that too. I've always tried to say it in a less elegant way of like be a collector of stories. The sooner you're aware of your journey. And then you can be like, oh, if that was interesting, that just happened to me or that I felt or that that interaction I just had and just file it away because then those stories are what you're going to use to help it, you know, show to us, not tell us about who you are and where you've been and where you're going to be going with it. So I, that's a great idea. Uh, and, well, we have students that say we're not the end of the process. I wonder if you could provide us a And what happens to the missions after you give an application? I don't mind starting off. Well, well, I'll, give, I'll give the Wake Forest a version. You can hear the Duke version. I'm sure they're not too far off. But, uh, Dr. Haney, I'm getting the, the, the echoing again. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, for Wake Forest, we actually do not have uh, prerequisite classes. Um, we just say, take the classes. They're going to best prepare you to do well on the MCAT. Um, um, and also, you know, fire your intellectual curiosity, your, 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 your academic journey, your passions, make it something you're, you, know, you enjoy and it's going to inspire you and be sustainable. But, the classes are going to best prepare you for the MCAT. Um, uh, you know, make connections, get the, we've already talked about the experiences, but um, um, so when it comes time to apply um, at, at Wake Forest, you, you're, we have um, some initial criteria that you have to meet. We, we're lucky enough, it's a blessing and a curse to get to over 10,000 applications each year for 145 spots. Um, so we do use a couple of numbers at the start. Uh, it may help us filter a little bit, but we also use them because we know people who meet these criteria are, are proven to succeed in our curriculum. Uh, and so if you meet these criteria now, we can just focus on all these other things we've been talking about, the type of person you are uh, and look at you, you know, you hear about holistic review, but once we know you're qualified, now we can start sorting people out by those other qualities they have. So our initial criteria are this year, it's a 502 MCAT, and a 3.2 science GPA. If you don't meet that 3.2 science GPA with your undergraduate work, we will accept graduate work, post bac work, as long as it's 15 science credits or more. Now we're gonna look at that path. What was your journey? Why did you struggle in uh, undergrad? Um, and as long as there is a reasonable story, um, um, you know, we're, we're definitely open to looking at that for sure. Um, if you meet those two criteria, we'll send you a secondary application. So, you know, your initial application is your general essay, your general list of experiences. But each school is then going to say, 
hey, if we want to hear more from you, we're going to send you our own specific questions that just like you probably had to do for undergrad. Um, take those seriously. They're not just something you kind of cut and paste because each school has picked these questions because they, you know, we're trying to find the stuff that means something to us at Wake Forest or Duke or Carolina, et cetera. Um, so take them seriously. Don't, uh, you know, put, put a lot of thought into them and um, don't just make them kind of generic answers. Um, we also, we've been working with this thing called the situational judgment test. It feels like it's a thing where it's kind of like a pre-interview where it puts these scenarios in front of you and you kind of have to, how, how would you respond to them? And it's, it's one way to kind of say, well, who might be a good interview later um, and try and predict that. It's, it's this desperate, we're trying to get as much evidence as we can in this kind of very much more of an art than science process. But so we look at this, so those are the kind of the, uh, once you meet our criteria, you take that little judgment test, you send in your secondary application responses, and then we, we our committee looks at those and we uh, evaluate them, and then we decide who we're gonna interview. We interview about 500 folks each year. Um, that looks like, as I mentioned at the start, it looks like it's gonna be again virtual this year, both because of the pandemic and also because it seems to, applicants seem to like it because it saves them time and money. Uh, and then we'll hopefully next year be able to bring folks on campus who we do accept or wait list uh, to come visit us um, and really get a you know stronger sense once they've narrowed it down to the schools they were accepted to. So that's that's a that's a whirlwind tour, a, a fifty thousand foot overview of the application process. After you hear from you know what Duke's is like, we can you know get more. Right, we're fairly close to what, what um, you know Wake's doing. Uh, Ideally, uh, you know, our focus tends to be more on, on some of the secondary application rather than the, the, the primary part. But, you know, to start out, you know, we've kind of listed things as expectations because we've realized that cell biology at Charlotte might be, not be the cell biology you get at Chapel Hill. So, so we've kind of modified the way we've kind of looked at, you know, some of the classes. So there are expectations and I guess part of that is you know, you should have taken, a, you know, some of the upper division, you know, courses like, you know, cell bio, biochem, immunology, you know, th those sort of things. That, but you know, for, even if you're a, a non-science major, you still probably should have taken those sort of courses if you were thinking of med school. And then, you know, you get, you, you have your AMCAS application that you fill out. And then uh, we don't really use any numerical criteria. Um, we send everybody a secondary. But the screen for the secondary is the essays. And, you know, I think uh, most of you, um, most applicants kind of know that the Duke essays are probably one of the more challenging ones within the United States or probably the most challenging. And, and there's a reason for that. We, we figured that if you're willing to fill out this application, we're willing to look, um, you know, and fill out the essays, we're willing to look at your application. If you're not willing to fill out the essays, then maybe this isn't the right place for you. So uh, instead of a, uh, so we allow the applicants to, to, to self screen them, uh, uh, them through this process. So, so it, it's up to you, not up to us. And then we'll, we'll go through all of these essays, but you know, the, the goal with the essays that I think probably with all the other schools is that, you know, one, it's, it's to kind of inform us as to how you go about you know, and, and how you got to this point. But the other part is that you need to understand why you're doing this as well. And, and so, I mean, that's why we have all these, like, you know, different questions on our, our, our secondaries, because if, if you have a better understanding of what you're doing, then you can inform us as a little bit better than, you know, if you had not, uh, you know, gone through those essays. So we're, we're trying to get you to really think through this process and, and, and really, you know, understand, you know, what you're getting into. And, and then, you know, once you get past the, the essays, you know, we'll review everything, you know, holistically. So we're going to look at, you know, your, your your academics, as well as your clinical experiences, your letters of rec, your, your essays. I mean, everything gets reviewed. Um, and then after that, you're invited to the interview and we use the uh, multiple mini interview and we've had that for, I think, close to 10 years. And, uh, you know, this year we were able to do it virtually as well, you know, after 6 months of prep, but we're, and I think, um, we're. Yeah, and this stands now. We're probably going to do it for um, you know this incoming for 2022's uh, entering class, and then you know once you've gone through the interview, that interview is scored, 
and then you are presented to the exec committee by an exec committee member, and then the exec committee will vote on your application, and then, you know, and that's how we kind of decide um, where, where the, the class stands after that. And I think this year we interviewed a shade under 700 people. Last year, roughly the same. Uh, this year, though, um, the for the AMCAS we had like over, I think roughly around 9,400 AMCAS applications, of which was totally crazy. We had, I think, 5,400 people um, kind of complete the, the secondary, which is like a thousand more people than we had last year. So it's becoming, I guess the bottom line with that is becoming much more competitive to, to get an interview spot just because more people are filling out the, the secondaries. And our, our, our target class size is, is uh, roughly 120. All right, well, speaking of, of interviews, um, what do you look for in a personal statement and what really jumps out and grabs you in a personal statement? Well, I was an English major, so I, I love it being this personal statement doctor and editing them and, and looking at them. I, I, um, I, I think it goes back to some of the themes we've mentioned as, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a perfectly formed story with a, you know, a first act, a second act, a third act all mapped out. But if you, if there's a thread of a narrative, wow, that that's, that's really neat. If you can see like, oh, my, you know, here's my talents or something I did here. And then that built into something else. And that led me to test myself this way. And, oh, because of what I learned through these things, I could see myself going into, <clears throat> going into pediatrics or, becoming a, a research, you know, a scientist position. Not that you have to do those things, but it's neat if I can read a story that, and then start to think, oh, and I can kind of see you envision where this person's going and, and where they envision themselves going, and I'd like to help them get there. Um, we're all, you know, we humans, we, we love stories. We don't like PowerPoints. We don't like lists. Um, so, like, if, if you can, you know, weave a thread that you know, it doesn't have again it doesn't have to have perfect connections and be a straight line it can it can wander a little bit but if you can tell the story of your journey with those examples in there of little stories within the story to to ampli you know, to explain or to show what you're trying to tell us um, that's going to stand out you know a, a, a lot more to me than and someone else uh, another piece of advice I love about personal statements I heard was don't don't be more impressive be more human right so it, number one if you're trying to you know rehash your 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 resume or trying to shine a spot it, it you may not think of it it comes across and it um but if you can show you're more human of like here's where i struggled here's what i learned here's how i grew emphasize those things that's i think that's going to you know uh carry you uh, much you know, do you much more of a better better service Right. I mean, it's, it's called a personal statement for a reason. It's not a CV rehash. I mean, a lot of times people will kind of laundry list their what they've done before. I mean, we can see that throughout the entire AMCAS application. It doesn't add anything else to to, to what we're, we're looking for. So, I mean, your, your goal is to give us another dimension of you with, within this. And and if you can connect all the, the various dots, um, you know, and, and it creates a, a, a storyline that, you know, even better, um, you know, because it, it, maybe if you've done like totally diverse things that you know you don't see any like you know you know anything that kind of makes it connect you know there is always something that makes all you know all these like diverse things that you've done you know connect you know whether if you if you've worked in you know like uh for instance if you've worked at chick-fil-a i mean how is that going to relate to um you know medicine well it's interacting with people on it from everywhere on a daily basis providing proper good customer service and treating people kindly working as a team you know becoming part of a you know a leader of your shift maybe or learning how to you know help you know, your, your team work efficiently all those things have value to to medicine if you can talk about these sort of things you know about some of your various experiences i mean i don't know you, you pick something totally you know, wild like and for instance you know, maybe you were in finance before and then you decide to switch into medicine. I mean, how would you describe, you know, that sort of change? Well, it's still about it, talking with people, advising people to to choose the, the best option. I mean, in part of like, you know, what you're doing is like you're talking to people. Well, we think this treatment plan is is the best. 
easier options. Um, we can, you know, highlight which, you know, has benefits and, you know, positives and negatives of all of them, but, you know, it's, you know, you can always find something, and I think that's the, the, the probably the key is find that part that will make you connect with the person who's reading this. Because you know we're going through thousands of these, and you know, um, you know, you've got to have something that kind of really catches us and go, "Whoa, this is kind of interesting," and or this is actually a pretty cool story here, and 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 that that's what you, and you, and you want to you know really make the person stop and and really stay there. Again and again, and kind of look at this versus, you know, you know, just kind of listing. I did this. I worked in this lab. I, I did this, and, and and that's why I wanted to go and miss. Oh, I mean, that's 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 fine, but you know, there, hopefully, you know, we're looking for something that maybe a, a little bit different. You know, sometimes. Yeah, I can give you a few examples that come to mind that I still remember. Uh, one was, uh, you know, it was a person who worked as an EMT, and she was on a shift in Charlottesville during you know the the terrible events that happened there and so she was able to tell the story of that day and the struggle she went through and the the you know how she had to weigh with herself how i have to take care of this person who i completely disagree with and have these strong uh internal feelings of uh, of dissonance about what this person stands for yet i still have to help them and wow what a powerful story that was now that may make you say, "Well, great. How am I gonna? You know, I don't. I don't want to be a, in an event in history in order to have to tell a an amazing story." My other two favorites that I remember, just like Linton mentioned, it was my my literal favorite essay of all time is a a, a woman who just de who described her job as a waitress at East Coast Wings, and she was able to relate all those things that Dr. Yi just mentioned about being a team player and working hard and 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 being responsible, showing up for shifts and and connecting with people and, and her sense of humor. But again, she didn't have to say, I ha I'm a good team player. I have a good sense of humor. It just came out in her story. I, I believed it. My other favorite was another EMT. This was a much more boring story. It was just about a, how he was working on with it on a car that he used to, um, uh, you know, he used that skill to try and make some extra money. And he was, you know, he had his hands were all dirty and it was late at night. And he was on call, which he took, you know, he took the night shift so the other family people didn't have to worry about the night shift as much. And he got called in and they went on this call to a group home where, you know, the, the kid, was, the injury, it turned out to be not much had happened, but he relayed how he knew these people from previous calls and that, that continuity and uh, that, you know, responsibility and consistency and commitment he had with the job and the skills he demonstrated all came out in this story of a night that actually wasn't that eventful, but it just was a great snapshot and told me a neat little story or a vignette. And so last thing I'd say is, just like with an essay in your English class or anywhere else is, don't just open the computer and start writing, right? Think about, stop and say, well, what's my goal of this paper? Who am I? What, what message am I trying to get across? You know, it's a very deep philosophical question, who am I? But you know, for me, it was like, I, I'm a, I love to write, I love to communicate, and I'm gonna bring that side of things to medicine. Yours may be something different. Think of that first, and then everything will fall into place. And the last thing is have other people read it. You may think you did a great job, uh, uh, but have someone else read it and say, hey, did you get, you know, my, my mission was this, did I succeed? And they'll, you know, get, get a lot of feedback to see if you accomplished your goal or what you were trying to get across. Sometimes we're in our own heads and we know what we're trying to say, but we make sure that other people can see it. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. Um, I'd like to move on into the topic of interviews. And uh, I wonder when interviewing an applicant, what makes you say, wow, that was an impressive candidate for medical school? And conversely, what are some common mistakes that students make during interviews? Dr. Yee? Right. Yeah. So for myself, I, I don't interview anybody anymore because the multiple mini, um, in, in theory, they're not supposed to know who you are and you're not supposed to know who, who they are to, to eliminate as much you know, bias within the, the process as possible. But you know, I still watch what, what's going on. So I, I think um, you know, things that don't work well for, for applicants is if you're unkind to your, 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 you know, we have a team station. So in part of that is we've seen that people are sometimes unkind to their colleague and will put blame on their colleague or, or just not 
interact well with that person. So, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a lot of it's, this is people skills and, and you should always, you know, be cordial and collaborative and, and kind, you know, with the people that you're, um, you're working with on a, on a task. Cause you know, with, for the team station, it's not whether you complete it or not, it's, um, you know, how you work with, with that person. Um, other things, you know, sometimes people have been, yeah, rude to the, um, the interviewers. I mean, I mean, it's, it's almost unthinkable that you, you would go this far through the process and then, you know, do something, you know, as egregious as, as that, it, but it, it, it happens. Um, so, you know, again, you, you gotta just, you know, be nice to people and, and consider it. Everybody. That's probably the, the overall bottom line with, with the interview process. And then, you know, if you, if you don't know the answer, just say that you're not familiar with the, the topic. I and mean, I think, you know, we understand that not everyone is, you know, familiar with all the things we ask, and, but there's always other questions we can go to if you don't know anything on that, on that topic. So, I don't know, Daryl, anything else there? <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. I think of it as number one. Um, yeah, it's just your, your energy, your your body language, your your eye contact, your smile. Those things they're 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 vague and they're subjective, but they make they make a difference. And how an interviewer feels about you, that they, how can they envision you interacting with patients? So, do some practice interviews where people give you feedback or oh, I hate this, but watch yourself on videotape. Uh, you know, even just to see. Like people in some of my first interviews way back when they said, wow, you seem really comfortable and you're yeah, kind of late. And I was like, I didn't know that, but I was overcompensating for how nervous I was by like kind of getting myself to relax and sitting back. And I was giving off a totally different vibe than what I thought I was uh, and definitely what I was feeling. So the more practice and more, more feedback you can get, the better. Um, and watch yourself. I also found out when I watch myself, I'm a, I'm a head bobber. I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, well, uh, so I try to learn to try and control that as I'm speaking. Um, but, and then it gets to back to some of the same thing, themes we've mentioned with your essays, with your secondary responses. The interview is just another version of that. It's just kind of live as opposed to in writing. So think of the themes of like, don't be more impressive. Don't use every question as a chance to list off, you know, make sure that everyone knows how great you are and all the things you've done on your, on your resume. Um, at the same time, there is an art to it where if you use your experiences to kind of inform your answers, well, wow, that's really good. So if you're presented with a hypothetical scenario and you can mention, boy, that reminds me of a time when in the research lab, I struggled with a similar situation Here's what I learned from that one. So this is how I would apply it to that. This scenario you've presented to me. Whoa, that's really interesting. You just you kind of snuck in a resume uh, kind of highlight, but more importantly, you snuck you 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 brought in something you learned from an experience that says, oh yeah, I believe you know you could do that. And in a similar fashion, if someone asks you about something you've done in your past an actual experience, then it's never a bad idea to connect it to something hypothetically like. Oh, yeah, they ask you about your research, your, your time in the research lab, and you say, yeah, and, and, you know, and based on what I learned from that is here's what I could see doing in a, some sort of other situation in the future. I think those are kind of two nice styles that you could use when approaching almost any interview question. Yeah, so professionalism would be key in how you conduct yourself. I mean, if you had to use an overall term. And we, you know, Dr. Yi said you wouldn't think, but we've had all the same things. We've had people with sunglasses on their head in the middle of a med school interview. And it's like, it might be a silly thing to judge somebody on, but you're also like, who in the world would do that at the same time? And so it just makes me wonder, and if they would do that in this situation, imagine what they would do once they're accepted and comfortable. And so not that we expect everyone to be robots, but just get some feedback, you know, think, you know, do those mock interviews, be professional. Um, I don't know, they, they do happen, so pay attention. Thank you, Dr. Rosenbaum. Um, I have a question I'd like to address first to Ms. Ames. Um, because some of our students may not be very familiar, uh, could you give some background on some of the issues that medical schools are trying to address concerning diversity and inclusion, and then some of the ways that they may be trying to address it as far as um, you know, uh, programs, initiatives, recruiting, 
uh, students and then uh, once students are in medical school, how they are supported. Yes, of course. Um, so I'll first start and say by um, and start by saying that our students are really the voice of our institution, um, and they make way for a lot of opportunities within the school of medicine realm. Um, our students sit on um, a lot of our educational committees as well as a lot of like we have a admissions committee. So we have an SNMA student who sits on the admissions committee. Um, we have student um, organizations and um, we call them interest groups that are across all of our educational programs. So for SID, um, I'm sorry, student inclusion and diversity, I'll say SID a lot. Um, we have um, a lot of representatives from the SNMA um, program from the LAMSA, so Latino Medical Student Association, um, Safe Zone, and um, those are the students of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so all of these students have a voice within the medical education realm. Um, just recently, back in 2020, we um, started a racial equity task force um, within the student, the School of Medicine, as well as institution wide. Um, and that was from the voice of our students. They had a student petition um, that they uh, initiated and it started with our SGA students and our SNMA uh, students, our student, Med uh, student National Medical Association. And so from that, we've developed different uh, initiatives around racial equity with the racial equity task force. Um, we have uh, a new um, justice thread that's within the educational um, the curriculum, we have um, a race and medicine module that we're getting ready to adopt. Um, and all of this really came, um, the, the justice thread was already in the works before the, um, the petition from our students. Um, but our students really have a voice, I'm sorry. Uh, I know I'm going over, but we have a lot of opportunities in the Office of Student Inclusion and Diversity to make sure our students are at the forefront of the medical institution. Um, so our students take part in a lot of opportunities to uh, focus on racial equity, uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives within the medical school. Um, we have SID open house and SID common ground sessions where we hear from our students, we talk to our students, um, and any initiatives that they think we should address, we take them to the board and we go from there. Um, and then with the SID open house sessions, all of our URM, underrepresented minority acceptance students, uh, we have a second session for them to hear from SID, um, our faculty, our staff, our advisors, as well as our URM students um, about why they should come to Wake Forest School of Medicine. Um, so those are some things, Dr. Rosenbaum, did I miss anything? No, you think I captured everything? Okay. <laughs> And I hope I answered all of your questions, Dr. Haney. Yes, um, Dr. Yee, do you, would you like to speak for? Right, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for a number of years, we've had a uh, representation on the admissions committee from you know, uh, our, our student groups. So that includes SMA, LMSA, APAMSA, uh, Duke Med Pride, which is our LGBTQ group, as well as from the, uh, the general uh, student body. And you know, we, we've always valued the, the student input. I, I think sometimes they are wiser and offer more suggestions than the, the standard faculty. Uh, and so they've been you know, instrumental in, in helping us you know, mold the way we um, you know, handle the admissions process. Um, additionally, you know, the students, you know, again, the, the common theme here is the students were a, a driving force in creating a, a course that we you know, that has a, a thread running through our first two years here called, you know, cultural terms of health and health disparities. And this again, it, you know, probably, I think this is the third year, at least that it's, or fourth year that the class has been in, in place that, you know, this was a student driven initiative to, you know, address some of the uh, disparities that existed within the, the healthcare system and, you know, within, you know, Durham's communities. So, you know, again, it's you know, students, you know, to, you know, echo Lamanca students are the, uh, the the driving force a lot. You know, the, you know the our you know anti racism initiatives. Thank you, Doctor Yi. Um, all right, Doctor Nagpal, it's great to see you. <laughs> um, I have uh, several questions for you today, um, and just so everybody knows, you are an alumnus of UNC Charlotte. 
And um, uh, can you talk a little bit about your experiences being a pre-med student at UNCC, uh, as well as if there's anything you wish you had known while you were pre-med? Um, I uh, look fondly back at my time at Charlotte. Um, it was challenging, but I felt like the classes at Charlotte um, were uh, challenging and uh, they prepared me well for medical school. Um, I found out early on, and I think I was fortunate to find out about the pre-med advising program uh, at Charlotte, and I think it was a big help to kind of have some someone there that you could talk to about anything going on with your application. So um, anybody that's has in touch base with Dr. Haney, I strongly recommend it because she can help guide you on your path um, towards medical school. Um, the, you know, you, when you, as a Charlotte student, I'm sure it's a common experience with people at other uh, undergrads as well. Um, there's not really much that can prepare you for the challenges of um, medical school. I think I remember one of the admissions uh, uh, people come into Charlotte when I was there and saying that if you took your hardest uh, science uh, semester and doubled it, that's kind of what medical school feels like, and that's probably true. Um, I think it's one of the things I wish I'd known before going to medical school is um, just finding ways in undergrad to manage stress and uh, healthy ways to manage your stress and finding healthy outlet outlets for managing stress because medical school is super stressful. Um, I think that once you get to medical school as a Charlotte alumni, and I had a couple of Charlotte alumni in my class with me, um, you it, it's going to be a it is a rough ride for everybody. I don't think it's that's just specific to UNC Charlotte students, um, but in medical school, and I, I realized this going through, and maybe by the end of my second year uh, of medical school and finishing all the classes before I started my clinical year is that medical school classes and semesters don't really get any easier. It's just you realize how much you're able to do and accomplish and how strong you really can get and what you're capable of when you really push yourself. Um, so there'll be times um, when you get into medical school that you'll think that you were the one mistake that the admissions committee somehow let slip through the cracks and get in and um, that you're not alone. Everybody feels that way. I remember calling my parents and saying, I think they picked the wrong person. I shouldn't be here. I remember walking next to the library towards the medical school, having that specific conversation, the first block of medical school. Um, but you're not alone. Um, you're, UNC Charlotte will prepare you just as well as any other uh, undergraduate uh, uh, institution will for medical school and it's it's such a great ride once you get used to it and you realize just how how capable you are of doing all these things in these giant stacks of of uh, four weeks worth of learning that you were able to absorb and and uh, it's just it's so it's so awesome just to see what you're capable of. Um, so that's kind of been my experience as a Charlotte student. The other thing I would say is um, you're in a, a city that has a ton of opportunities to get involved uh, with, um, but as a pre-medical student. Um, when I was there, and I know COVID kind of affects a lot of this, uh, I got really involved in a free clinic in Concord. And um, just it, it became my passion, and I think it really helped me. Uh, in the admissions part, because I was there at that free clinic every single week. It taught me things about the healthcare system and how there's just this giant gap in care for people who don't have insurance and don't qualify for Medicare, Medicaid, and taking care of these people. And, um, you know, that that taught me a lot. I did do some of the shadowing, but I really think like like was mentioned before, try to get into those opportunities where you're actively learning uh, about yourself because it'll be something that you can you can use as you go forward to teach you about yourself and how you can uh, how you can communicate that with the admissions committee um, too and I think that'll that'll help you and so I think that's pretty much it thanks Dr. Nagpal I have one one very quick question to ask you would you please tell everybody what your majors were at UNC Charlotte what you majored in 
Yeah, so um, I got a music degree. Um, I got a BA in music from Charlotte. Um, I played trumpet. Uh, I didn't realize I wanted to go to medical school until my second year of, of college. Actually, the, the summer before I got in a giant car wreck and had to be airlifted to CMC. And actually, it was in my personal statement. Um, it's probably somewhere in the in a drawer in Dr. Haney's office. But um, just uh, the experience I had of being on the patient side of, uh, of the experience and what impact the doctors had on me when I was airlifted and cared for. Um, I put a lot of that in my personal statement because it kind of taught me the kind of doctor that I would want to be. And I guess that somehow kind of led me towards going into emergency medicine um, because I want to be that, the kind of doctor that other people were to me um, down the road. But yeah, I was a, a music major and actually lo I'm looking right up at it right now. It's the piece of paper on my wall that uh, I don't know if I'll use, use it again, but I think it did teach me a lot about what uh, intense practice and studying can do because a lot of that is in, in learning your instrument too, so. If, if I could touch on a couple things that BJ is putting on. First of all, um, med school is going to be the toughest thing that you've, you've ever done. And so the way to survive that is just take it day by day. So every day, just be a better med student than you were the day before. And then eventually you're going to see that, you know, like those stack of papers and things that you had to go through. Eventually you would have learned all of those things. Um, and then, you know, as residents, you know, with, it's the same thing. That's going to be even worse than med school, but take it day by day. So each day, just be a better resident than you were the day before. And then I think the other thing is, um, I think Daryl, you're an English major, right? And then VJ, you're a music major. And I wanted to go into to music school, but I ended up going to med school. So, so for the applicants out there, you don't necessarily need a science degree to do this. I mean, there are, you know, going into, I mean, all these things have value. Music, I mean, I think VJ highlight, you, you got to practice, you got to learn your stuff. Um, it's part of also being, you know, with a team. I mean, you're, you're in a band, you, you got to interact with everyone. And, um, and then, yeah, so, and then, you know, music and, and literature are forms of communication. Uh, you know, it's, it's really weird, but I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, you, you, sometimes you feel the beat of the room and, and you kind of know what, what needs to happen in there. And, um, so, you know, all these things, you know, add value to the application. It's not necessarily just biochem, it's music, English, poetry, all these other things can, you know, only make you a better person and thereby a better applicant and then a better med student. Thank you, Dr. Yi. We are um, about out of time. I would like to have the opportunity for um, a couple of student questions. Um, if you would like to put a question in a chat box, um, probably the easiest way to get way to do this. But any questions you'd like to ask our guests today, students? Um, well, yes, of course, um, we have a question here uh, for Dr. Rosenbaum. Do you have any information about when Wake Forest plans to uh, accept their first cohort of students for uh, the Charlotte campus of Wake Forest School of Medicine? Yeah, the, the yeah. plan is, I think they're hoping 2024, it could be 2025. Um, you now we're already uh, sending some of our current students, uh, our current they're just starting third year. They're going to be doing some rotations uh, down in the Charlotte area. And then um, uh, next, the, the class that we're going to be matriculating this summer, they're going to have an opportunity to do their third year in Charlotte, some of them as well. So it's going to be a transition, but 2024, 2025 is when the, the first class of 40, we're aiming for 45 uh, students to start uh, at the new building in Charlotte. And I've been on these calls. Apparently, they just announced where that is going to be. La Monica, did you see? I was on in another one of these calls. So somewhere in Midtown is where the new education building is going to be. Yeah, I was on the staff council call, but I did uh, log on to Facebook and it's still up there. I think the live is still um, published. If you go to the Wake Forest Baptist Health page, um, they did announce the actual location of the school in Charlotte. So yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. exciting news. Absolutely. We can't wait. <laughs> 
Um, I have another question here um, on the application. Uh, uh, students do have to enter um, a contact name or supervisor's name for each experience that they report and uh, and contact information for each person uh, that's uh, in charge of their experiences. Um, a student has asked about the verification process um, about, uh, if, I guess, how, how, how do y'all verify what they report on the application and is anything extra needed? Look, I think just take what AMCAS has on there. Um, yeah, I mean, if we had to, if we had to verify everything from every single application, <laughs> that'd be a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, we end up whatever AMCAS verifies, we verify, and uh, um, and honestly, for something like a letter, it's gonna it becomes more like you can tell from the letter itself. What did they say about you? How in depth was it that they? And if you can, it's it's kind of maybe a little awkward. I don't know if I could do this, but if if you can gently remind your advisors hey, when you write, if you write me a letter, um, describe what I you know actual behaviors I demonstrated or actual you know. Um, Things I challenges I overcame or things I was responsible for those again that's where that comes back to that theme of show me don't tell me instead of just saying you know Johnny is it's really nice to people and Johnny's a hard worker and 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 Susie does if you actually tell me some some examples if because that's what I'll use the letters for sometimes it's like I love looking oh this person volunteered at a free clinic and I go and oh I see a letter from the director of the free clinic then I go look at that letter and if it describes like, wow, this person was so committed to our, they showed up every week for two years and wow, here's what they, they grew in their responsibilities and here's what, and wow, they were a great translator and, and like, wow, now I'm, now I'm, that means much more than just somebody saying that person's right. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. And uh, one last question and I, I think we are out of time. Um, this is for Dr. Yi. Is Duke planning on going back to in-person interviews, or will you stay virtual uh, for for the future? So, yeah. So for yeah, this coming so for 2022's class, that's definitely going to be virtual. Um, hopefully, the country is going to be in a better place for 2023's entering class, and I, I think we're it, it's certainly subject to debate, but I think we're trying to lean back towards doing in-person. Just because I, I, you know, it, there's, you know, I think, Joe, you talked about this as well, but there's pluses and minuses to this. This, and I, I think, you know, getting a chance to meet our students and and actually come on campus and and see, you know, the, the hospital and stuff, is uh, you know a, a great thing for for the applicants. But you know, that's weighed against cost. You know, having to you know check uh you know flight aware and the flight misery map on a constant basis, as well as looking on you know. <laughs> <laughs> looking what traffic is on like the, the I-40 going towards, you know, RDU, um, you know, snow days. Um, but then, you know, that's coupled with like the, the virtual realm, you know, like, you know, if we lose connection and that wipes out an interview day, is that the same as a snow day? And, uh, you know, I think some of our applicants had, one of our applicants had an actual fire in his building when he was actually going through the, the MMI. So he had to drop out because, he <laughs> can get back in his building. So, yeah, it's it's a work in progress, but I, I think you know, we we would like to get back to doing this in person. Um, I don't, Daryl, what, what are your thoughts on? Yeah, that this I, we're probably leaning towards we're gonna stay virtual, but like just Dr. Yi said, there were just we're 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 don't hold me to any of this because we're still. We might need to see how another year goes and we we may have a different opinion then but we're actually leaning a little more towards virtual but yeah we we miss out on that secret weapon of getting because when i think when people come to not as many people know about winston-salem our facilities and they go oh wow when we when we get a chance to bring them here and you get a feel for a person but we're also like what we don't we do want to be as inclusive and, and and not have cost and and work schedules and other things be a barrier so yeah, more to come. Maybe another year will help us feel strong, more strong, more sure one way or the other. But we're we're leaning. We might stay virtual for the interview part. We would definitely have a come visit us after that for those who are accepted and serious. Yeah, your your building's like really nice. I mean, I, I would think that'd be a major uh, attraction to just 
you know, I mean, it's like, wow, this is actually a cool place to study medicine. I mean, to, to spend medicine. I know. I love coming to work there each day. Yeah. So yeah, it's like you, you weigh these pros and cons and so we'll see. Yep. Yeah, it is a beautiful building. Um, Jay, do we have time for one more question or how are we looking? Yeah, we, we can do one more list. That'd be great. All right. Okay, super. All right, um, last question then, and this is to, to both, both schools. How do you view international student applicants at Duke and Wake? Yeah, for us, um, you're, you're treated in the same pool as everybody else. Uh, I mean, I think there's always, you know, certain challenges that, you know, international students face and it's probably, you know, one is finances. So, you know, sometimes you're not eligible for, you know, the same sort of uh, aid that, you know, the, the US you know, graduates are. And I guess the other part is, you know, when you actually apply for residency, I mean, there, you know, some programs will not even look at your application if you're a, you know, a non US citizen. And, you know, we, for example, you know, we had a situation, we had a, um, a, a Canadian student here who was going into emergency med. And then, um, you know, she had, you know, presented it, you know, ASAP and done all these other things. And, you know, I, I asked my, you know, my buddies over at Harbor UCLA, I go, how come you didn't interview her? And, and he, and my, and, you know, Dave went back through things, go, oh yeah, it's cause she's, uh, she's on a, you know, an F1. I go, I go, dude, how could you not do that? And then, but I tell him, hey, wait, but she's getting married to one of her fellow students. And then, and he goes, well, when? He goes, I go, well, she'll be married, I think by January. And he says, oh, then we could do it because then she became eligible for, you know, the, the county of Los Angeles to actually look at her as a potential applicant. So there are hurdles that, you know, the international students do face, but, uh, you know, again, you know, you just have to be kind of creative as to, to how you're going to get around these things. And at Wake Forest, you need to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident as our criteria. Thanks, Dr. Rosenbaum. Well, I believe that we are um, uh, officially out of time now. I want to thank uh, thank you so much to our special guest today. We appreciate very much your time, your expertise, and uh, everything that you shared out with students is so valuable. Um, Jay, Rachel, anything that you want to add? I just want to say again, thank you to our guests and thank you Liz, for moderating our panel and working through our tech problems. And thanks again to all the students who showed up. Uh, very good stuff. I know you all have uh, learned quite a bit as we have. So, uh, Rachel, any, any thoughts from you? No, I apologize for the intro. My internet dropped as soon as we started. What are the odds? Um, but I was able to jump back in and listen in and this was fantastic and super informative. So thank you so much for your time today. Everyone have a good afternoon and stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon.